I'd like to welcome everyone to the class. And we're uh, grateful for the opportunity we have to, to teach uh, from the Family History Library at Brigham Young University. And just to let anybody who may not be aware online that the, the library is now open uh, for reg, well, not quite regular hours yet from uh, 10 until eight in the evening, Monday through Friday. Uh, is it a little not quite so late on Friday? But anyway, there's at least um, some time that we're there and physically, but we also have uh, virtual connections directly to the library. If you want to get on your computer and get in and go to the BYU Family History Library website, you'll find uh, a link to a virtual desk and we'll have someone there manned off during the time that we're open and uh, we'll be able to answer questions. So these webinars, uh, classes and webinars are being recorded and they will be uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And also they will be on uh, listed and linked from that same BYU Family History Library website. Um, we're going to talk today about discovering your ancestors using uh, federal census records. Um, <clears throat> you might think that this is a rather simple or kind of very uh, beginning kind of subject, and in part it might be considered that way, but uh, what you'll find out is that it is actually not quite as simple as you might think. One of the, one of the <clears throat> interesting things that happened, oh, probably a long time before many of you were born, um, is I made a visit to uh, the, what was then the uh, Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Uh, and I can remember going in and, and hearing about something called the U.S. Census. And I said, well, you know, I'd like to look at, maybe I should look at some census records about my ancestors. And uh, I was shown a, a big set of books that were uh, the index uh, in various forms to the, to the census records. And then I was able to find the, a, a film, a microfilm uh, that had the census record on it. And I can remember uh, putting that into one of the microfilms machines and, and basically saying, I can't deal with this. Uh, I have no idea what's going on here. I don't know how to find anything. And it was just, it was just a mess. Well, fast forward, you know, almost 40 years later, I would guess that um, uh, we have it pretty easy because all of the censuses, uh, the United States federal census records that are available with the missing one census that we'll talk about that uh, are now digitized online and in, variety, in a variety of websites. And also they are um, indexed. And so you can search by name. That's good news. You'll find out as we go along here to, to today in the class that that may not be as good as news as that you might think it was. So let's move on. The federal census is mandated by the United States Constitution. We don't have uh, any uh, uh, way to get around having a, a census every 10 years for the years in, on the years ending in zero. So it began in, in, uh, with the, uh, the censuses in the 1700s and the 1800s, and now we're into the 1900s. And uh, every 10 years since the Constitution came into effect in 1790, we've had a census um, that uh, has been as, as much at the time, depending on the time, of course, as much as it was possible to uh, count all the people in the United States. That, of course, has really never happened, but uh, it was a very good goal. And over the years, it's probable that a fairly high percentage of all the people in the country show up in at least one census. The only people who don't, obviously, are those who died in between censuses, uh, children who were born, uh, let's say, after 1930 and, be and died before 1940, uh, will not show up in the censuses. But in some cases, with some of the census records, you're able to tell that they did exist, even if they're not showing up in the census. 
the real reason for having a United States census as established by the Constitution is to reapportion the representation of the state's representatives in the Federal House of Representatives to Washington, D.C. And uh, as you may know from some history or may not know, but that has been a tremendous uh, political and uh, somewhat social issue all across the United States ever since uh, they began the process. Because reapportionment means that you have to redraw maps. And when you redraw maps, you have people who, uh, who for any, any reason and no reason, and for uh, a lot of political reasons, can, uh, believe that their map should be different than someone else's map because they want to include all their friends and they don't want any of the people that aren't their friends. So they draw maps that either include or exclude. So the, the census creates a new, uh, a new map drawing uh, process every time that uh, it, it uh, happens. And so we just passed a census back in the year 2010, and we'll have another census, uh, excuse me, in 2020 also, and we'll have another census in 2030. And so uh, this is kind of an ongoing process as we, as we go along. Um, <clears throat> so here is uh, you know, the copy of the, of the original. This is a screenshot from one of the uh, uh, copies of the digitized copy of the original census in 1790. And so it's been held every 10 years since that early 1790 census. Um, in 1890, 100 years later, the census was damaged by a fire and then completely destroyed by the government. Most of what you hear, kind of the traditional story that's back there from the, um, uh, in among the genealogical community is that it was the census, the 1890 census was burned. Well, that's, partially true. There was a fire and a significant, some significant portion of the census records were burned. But subsequently, they could have been saved had the, the government uh, decided to do so. But it sat, the census records sat around four years and they never apportioned uh, enough money to have them uh, uh, restored and, and put into some form that they could be preserved. And so basically, uh, at the end of one session, the, the uh, head of the Library of Congress, who had that responsibility at the time for storing the uh, partially burned census, census records, simply threw them out uh, because nothing was allocated for their preservation. So that's, that's the real story of how it happened, in a sense. And uh, it, it brings up a really good point, because we should all, as gene genealogists, be very much concerned about preservation of records, particularly those records that have significant genealogical interest on, and are uh, and are should be uh, uh, preserved. Presently, all of the existing census records have been digitized, and the, the digital copies are now available through all the censuses that are presently available. So. <laughs> We have to understand also that the federal census records are divided into two distinct types of reports. From 1790 to 1840, the census has only had the names of the head of the household and a bunch of numbers or tick marks to indicate how many people were in the particular families. If you're a very good researcher and you have a lot of uh, and you know a lot about the other records that are available the census records can sometimes between 1790 and 1840 be decisive in telling you uh, whether or not uh, that family had uh, five children or four children or whether the uh, the wife was alive or whether she was deceased or whether the husband was deceased so these, uh, there are, there's still a tremendous amount of rec of information. And what is most important about the early census records is they establish a specific location where the, where the people were located. When you do identify a family in one of the early census records, 
you really have a window opened for many other kinds of records that are um, just as valuable and, and sometimes more valuable than, than the census records because you have the person identified in a particular place at a particular time. And that helps you to not only identify the individual and, dis and distinguish the individual from others, people with the same name, but it also gives you an opportunity to look for records that, that were very, very likely crea created at the same time and place, for example, uh, land and property records are the next big set of records that would be specifically available from that kind of a, from the fact that you learned, had learned they, um, of the location where the family was. And uh, court records of all kinds, probate records, uh, birth and death records, a lot of different kinds of records that would be uh, possibly produced simply by fact that you now know where this person lived and where their family was located. Um, so that is increasingly, it becomes, uh, it, the, the census records by themselves are not an end. Just because you find your family in the census record does not say, oh, I'm done. I found all the information I need to know about this family. The answer there is you've just begun. It is not at all, uh, that kind of a simple one-on-one -on -one relationship between uh, having a census record and being finished with your synodological research. Please do not believe that because that is not true. Okay. And uh, one point, a kind of an aside here, is that the National Archives, uh, the United States National Archives, has blank census forms for every single census from 1790 to the current census records. And so you need to, if you, if you can't read the headings or if you want some, a, keen, a convenient way to, to get into the census records, you might want to have a copy of the uh, headings up there uh, on the second monitor or up to, on an open window where you can go check real quick which column you're in because sometimes it gets a little bit confusing about uh, the information that you're trying to read across especially on the early census records because they change uh, quite frequently. And uh, that's the reminder that they're helpful for reading the column headings. So where are all these census records? Um, ultimately, what's available and has been preserved are preserved in the National Archives. And they are uh, the paper copies and the original copies of the census rec uh, records have been uh, collected as they are. Although some of the records do exist in other parts of the country, the process that they went through to do the census, and this is kind of a simplified uh, type of, of uh, uh, general type of description of the process because it varied from census to census. Every 10 years, they decided different ways for doing the census. That's kind of goes along with having a federal government. But basically what happened then is that uh, the, the, each, as each census record is a separate um, record that you need to understand and understand what's there and what's not there and why there were changes and how to interpret the information that's, that's there. So all, this, all these census records now, as I've mentioned now more than once, is that they're digitized and that they're located on a number of different websites. And I'll talk about how to get to those websites in just a, in just a moment. But let's go through kind of the process of getting the census records. They, the government, the federal government and the legislature had to, had to um, run from the, sense, the previous census it was left up to the states to take the information. Then they, they would then allocate the number of representatives per state. The states would then take uh, the, the information and set up the, the districting for each of the areas that would elect those representatives. Well, at the same time, they had to get ready for the next census. And as the population moved, then they had to redo that. So they did a set of maps 
uh, these census maps are still available and they are also online and uh, you can have a look at those. And then they would they divided the maps into and the states into enumeration districts. And sometimes those enumeration districts did not correspond to the existing political uh, entities. There could be an enumeration district that had a whole a county or might have more than one county or parts of two count of three counties or whatever. But the enumeration districts were more based on population centers. And so once they had those, then they uh, hired enumerators, people to go out and actually do the census and uh, be, participate in, in uh, going out and enumerating the people. And uh, during, depending on which years, the original enumeration lists that were created, the census rec enumerators were the people who wrote out the records of the census and filled in the forms from the families as they interviewed the families. So in understanding that process, you'll understand that somebody had to be talking to the numerator and telling them the information and that somebody may not have known the correct information about the family. Okay, so rather than, than uh, now thinking that there, you have this monolithic, totally reliable, federally sponsored United States Census, you can begin to see there are some cracks in that, that there's a lot of places where this information may or may not be correct. And so, and it, oh, by the way, what about the fact that the people didn't tell the truth? What if they came and asked how old they were and they said they, for whatever reason, didn't want to tell this person who they didn't know from Iraq all of the, why, uh, what, what their age was. Um, and uh, not casting any aspersions on, on one of the on males or females, I have found males who are, who, uh, who misrepresented their ages uh, as equal number of times as females. So there's no, uh, no one has a lock on, on uh, not wanting to give their exact or correct age. Well, what about if you, they didn't know their age? The United States early on, particularly, and even today, there are many people who are either illiterate or functionally illiterate, and they may not have, it may not remember or even know their own birth dates. And so there's a lot of uh, these, the census records um, variously are, uh, are categorized not as primary source records, but as secondary source records, because they came from people who were talking about information that they did not have official um, original documents to support. Uh, so the census record, in a sense, becomes an, a, a primary source because uh, it, they did go out and talk to the people and they were there uh, physically. But we always need to remember that, that uh, not all the information that we get out of the census is going to be um, completely um, accurate. And also to remember that these rep the, the information on the census records, the, the schedules as they're called, are not on the census.gov website. That, uh, that the census does not store or maintain or or digitize or do any of the rec any of those things with the records. Their their job is merely to do the count and uh, hire the people to uh, go out and make the count. So they don't really uh, they don't really have anything to do with the storing of those records. And as I mentioned, there are complete searchable collections of all the available census records on several websites. They're all over. And uh, the National Archives lists a few of those. This is a, a screenshot from the National Archives website uh, that there is uh, showing places where you can go to search the 1940 US Census. There's two, two problems here. One problem is that not all of the copies of the census are created equal. Um, in fact, there are copies of the census that um, are, have been altered considerably uh, just simply for what they would call readability. And a lot of the information that was contained on those early census records has been lost with certain digital copies of the census. So 
this, this, this particular fact makes it extremely important to become familiar with many of the different copies of the census. In addition, each of these different websites out there and the ones that are listed here like Family Search and, and Ancestry and uh, some of the other websites that may have uh, my heritage and find my past and, and uh, a few other websites out there that have uh, copies of the US Census. Each of them, um, in most cases, took a copy from the National Archives, made their own digital copy of it, and then uh, had uh, paid, either paid like Ancestry or some of the other uh, paid uh, subscription websites, paid people to, to um, index the, the census. Or like in the United States, I mean, excuse me, like in with Family Search. Uh, family search in the United States uh, used entirely used volunteers to do the indexes of the census. So when you start looking about this problem, uh, one of the one of the things that comes up uh, kind of frequently in um, with the website Family Search Family Tree website is uh, has to do with the sources listed. And uh, many times, uh, from time to time, and I just had somebody do this recently with one of my ancestors, uh, we've listed all of the different census records from the different companies. In other words, the 1930 census from Family Search, and perhaps from My Heritage, and perhaps from an uh, Ancestry, and perhaps from um, uh, Find My Past, and, and whatever. And, and because they're kind of uh, uh, want to tidy up things, they think that they're having four copies of the census is going to somehow use up more uh, tiny digital uh, dots of information than, uh, you know, than, than fewer sources. So they uh, tidy it up by taking out what they say are the duplicate sources. Well, they're not duplicate sources because each one of these companies did their own index and their own imaging of the census records. And so there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from looking at different copies of the census. If you can't read a census page, the simplest thing to start with is to go to some other company and look to the same page, because you may very well find that, that it's been um, digitized in a different format that or something more uh, that brings out more of the information on that page. Um, so this is a this is the link to this particular screenshot from the National Archives. Uh, when you're when we're through with these uh, uh, classes and the sets of of slides that go with them, then they will be made available online, and you will have the opportunity to uh, go through and and copy down all of that information. Uh, another option, of course, that we have is that if you request, we can make a digital copy, uh, excuse me, a PDF copy of the slides available. I still, uh, I, I hesitate to do that because I think people print that stuff and um, kind of not in the paper myself. Okay, now this is, this is important. What about free online census records? Well, Family Search obviously has a set of census records. But you may not be aware that the Internet Archive, which is archive.org, uh, has a, a set of the, of the censuses through 1930. It doesn't have the 1940 census, but it has 1790 to 1930. And the interesting thing about, national, about the Internet Archive or archive.org is that uh, this, the images they made of the census were from the raw originals. And much of the information that was on the original, original census of notations and marks and notes and scratches and letters and things are all preserved on the archive.org version of the census. So if you really need to dig in there and you're having a really difficult time, you may absolutely want to go find that copy of that page on the census on archive.org because that is as close to as uh, the original uh, reproduction of the original that you can get, and they're very fine copies of the originals. 
There is a place called censusfinder.com. And if you just can remember Census Finder and, and do a look for it on Google search, then what you'll find is a directory with links to all of the different copies of all the censuses, plus all the state censuses that were taken. Uh, we'll talk about other censuses, I will in another class, but mention that uh, the, the individual states, some of the states did send their own censuses uh, halfway between the two federal census. So if there's an 1880 census, then they did it in 1885, like New York, and then 1890 and 1895. Now, this is really good because if you happen to have one of those states that did the, the halfway census record, where they did it halfway through the 10 years, then you have a way of, of gathering more of the information that might have been lost from the 1890 census. But many of the states did not do that. So uh, there's not really a lot of information. Now, there's a whole world of information about how to uh, find out information, what other records we can go to to, uh, to find out about uh, the loss of the 1890 census and what, how to reconstruct the information that's there. And the state censuses are some of the first. There's also here uh, links on this website to all the other census records, even some outside of the United States, like Norway and Sweden and places like that. So you may very well want to become acquainted with this site. Over the years, I have referred to it many, many, many times because it's a, it's a short way of getting into, uh, rather than going in and searching for, uh, for additional, for records on, it, on, a, on a lot of different websites, I can go here and just have a place to click and go to uh, the records from each of those websites. Okay, so now we wanna get into some census terminology and uh, the United States Census Bureau. Now, this is the this is the other government one, census.gov. And the United States Census Bureau has uh, a glossary, and you can see that it's A through Z. And uh, this is just the first page of the A's. So if you need to know what the all the terminology is and how all of these different uh, how the laws affected uh, the uh, changing uh, nature of the of the uh, census records, then uh, you really ought to get in here and uh, get an idea of some of these terms, especially if you're coming, if you're looking at a record and it says something like, uh, uh, says some a word or something that you don't quite understand what that means, then here's, here's the dictionary of, uh, or glossary, if you will, of the, of the terms that have been Oh, questions come up and I'll answer it as we're going along here. Is there so also something like archive.org for England? Uh, no. <laughs> archive.org is, uh, is a unique company and it, it is, uh, if you are not familiar with archive.org, uh, you go on it today, archive.org, archive.org. It is uh, one of the largest digital repositories in the world of records. And it has, and there is more genealogical records in there than you can imagine. And it's all free, there's no charge. And uh, if you like books, uh, they're up to about 17 million volumes on archive.org, maybe up to 18 million by now. 18 million fully digitized, completely copyable books. Why? Because they have all, they copy everything that is in the public domain. And it is just, there is just an endless amount of information in there for genealogists because they just pick up everything from all over the place. And it really is moving very quickly into being the largest library, online library of information uh, in, in the world. They've always claimed the, that the Library of Congress is the largest library. But if you start to look at the statistics, 
the Internet Archive is very close to passing the, the Library of, of Congress as the largest library in the world. And so I would suggest you might want to, uh, to take a look at the Internet Archive. Okay, let's move along here. Here's the definition, for example. If you need to know who is considered to be African, it refers to people who identify their ancestry as Af African and does not include those who identified as African American. Okay, so these all of these things have to do, a lot of with, which have to do with, with analyzing the information and having statistics and things, but it also helps the genealogist to understand what those terms meant at the time they were put into the, the, the census itself. So basically, uh, knowing these definitions is important to uh, understanding what's actually there on the census records. Okay. Move on here. So that's on, uh, once again, the census.gov website. That's the, America, the census records. Um, if you're just interested in finding about, out about the United States, the census.gov website's a great place to go. It's very interesting. Go in there and see all the tech, you know, see how many people uh, live in what kind of part of the country and how big all the cities are and, and how many people have cars and how many, I mean, everything you can think of. They keep track of all sorts of information. It's just amazing place to look at. Okay, so here's some of the interesting things that you can find on the census records that you, that you perhaps were not particularly aware of. First of all, you can find out the number of children born to a mother and the number of children who are living at the time that the census was taken. So this is the, this is the, um, exactly some of the information that you should know about. And sec so here's, here's a census population schedule. Uh, it's called uh, of the census, and this is the 1900 census. And if you look carefully at the 1900 census, you'll have a, see a, uh, a description of uh, the number of uh, years married uh, and the mother of how many children and the number of the children who are living. Okay, so here, if we look here, we'll see that there were eight children born to this family and five of the children are living in 1900. And they've also, you see here, the number of, of years they've been married. Uh, let me go back from that so you can see they've been married for 20 years. And so if you go back in time from here, from 1900, that means between 1880 and 1900, this lady had eight children, and five of those children are only are living, are only five of those children are living in 1900. Three children died. And how is that not important to a genealogist to know that they need to go search for and account for three more children if they don't appear already on, uh, on family search, family tree? So if we keep going down here, there's six out of six. So six children are alive and six children uh, were born. And if you look over here on the census, you'll see uh, the names of six children. So now you have, as of 1900, you have the, the number of children who are born. In addition to that, you can look here and see that the wife was 35 years old and the husband was 41 years old in 1900. So there is a very distinct possibility that this family could have had more children after the 1900 census. So you need to do exactly the same thing with the 1910 census is to see how many children are listed in the 1910 census. But with this key showing you that six and six is correct, that gives you a kind of a, a head start on finding out and identifying all the children that are available to be found in that particular family. Okay, down here, you'll see that there were 10 children born and eight children are alive. 
in this case, the mother is 37 years old and the father is still 41. But uh, in that one, you can see that uh, there's some more work also that needs to be done to account for the two children who do not appear in the census, but are children of this particular mother. Now, the unfortunate thing about this is it does not say that they are, that the number of children that this mother is the mother of are all from that husband. So that's another issue. Another issue is if you go back in the next census and you back, which would be from 1900 would be the 1880 census, and you find that uh, uh, that they uh, that perhaps uh, that doesn't help be too much because the 20 year period. But if you go to the 1910 census and try to the same try to do the same thing, you may find that uh, there's another husband listed someplace. Okay, so there's lots of things that can happen here. And that's a little bit of why I said at the beginning that uh, census records appear to be a fairly straightforward and very simple thing. But once you start getting into them, then it becomes even more uh, complicated. Okay, so there's another thing that's showing here on this particular census record. And that is that uh, people are listed as being uh, the place of their birth and the place of their parents' birth. And so what we have here is uh, someone who says that their uh, parent was born in, uh, in England. At, they were born in England and their parents were born in England and their place of birth. And so there's a lot more information here. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the census records can get to be misleading in this regard particularly if the place of that is named as the place where their parents were born is not really a place. And why does that happen? Well, for example, uh, many, many German speaking, speaking people in the United States were, um, reg were show up in the census as having been born in Germany. Well, that usually reflects the uh, lack of, ge of geographic information on the part of the enumerators and a part on the part of the people who are uh, giving that information. Because through most of the time periods when the US census record recorded that information, Germany did not exist as a place. It was a group of people, it was a whole bunch of different countries and, and duchies and all sorts of of little political subdivisions. And it was unified only after a certain period of time. So it's, it, it's when it's listed like that, uh, that it sometimes becomes a little bit confusing. Um, many times, uh, for example, in one case that I dealt with that was pretty, that was became, it was kind of an issue, uh, was that the census listed the person as being born in Germany, which was the normal thing. But in going over, we found that the, his parents spoke Hungarian. And so the question was, well, where, was he really, where were the parents really born? And the answer was they were born in what we would call Hungary. But at that time, it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so everybody considered it to be Germany. Austria, as of course, was Germany at that time. No, that's not right. Austria was Austria and we called it Germany. Okay. Okay, let's move along here. So from 19, in the 1900 and 1910 censuses, you'll find this little helpful thing. And it can be extrapolated into the 1920 census by simply following and counting up how many children there are. That will not help you with finding a child who was born in 19, after the 1910 census and died before the 1911, uh, 1920 census. So you still have to do your genealogical homework to find those people. Now, naturalization status and the year of immigration. This is the tremendous help for finding additional records. In this case, we're going back to the same record that I had just a moment ago. Uh, this one happens to be from Eastern Arizona in Apache County. And we see that this person J.B. Patterson 
was uh, born in England, and it says that he immigrated in 1868, and he's lived in the United States for 37 years, and under naturalizations, it says N.A. Well, there again, probably a reason to go back to the uh, glossary and find out uh, what N.A. meant. It does not mean not whatever. It means naturalized. So what does this tell us? It tells us sometime between 1863, when this person immigrated to the United States, and uh, in the last 37 years, he went to a, a court and uh, applied for and received his citizenship. Now, since this is 1900, uh, we need to know one more thing, and that is that naturalization was done on a federal basis beginning in 1906. So even though this person was naturalized, what that meant was that his naturalization record was in a court in one of the states that he lived in, some place where he lived in those between 1863 when he arrived in the United States and uh, uh, the 1900 when he showed up in Arizona he obtained a, a naturalization. So that begins us on the process of searching for naturalization records for this particular person and hoping that the naturalization records give us some more insight into uh, where this person uh, was born in England, if we don't already know. So from 1900 to 1940, the United States began the process of asking when people came, immigrated to the United States, and uh, when they were naturalized, if they were not when, but if they were naturalized. And, uh, and the, the forms vary from year from each to each and one of the censuses, but they essentially have the same amount of information. Does that help us with people who immigrated back before uh, they would have been alive during the 1900 census? No, not much, because uh, the place was not identified in the earliest censuses. Another important thing was they give the occupation, and that happened over here. If we blow it up, you can see he's a manager, a teacher, a salesman, another manager, another teacher. So, and the public schools, and this gives us more, more information. In other words, we have something else we can go by. You may find that you're looking at John Doe, the manager, and you're not looking at John Doe, the salesman. They may have exactly the same name, they may live in the same area, but if by tracking their occupation, you can tell that they're different people. And that also gives you some insight into other types of records, like school records, in this case, governmental record. If they were hired by the city, there's probably some, some uh, history there that would uh, be about that person. As an automobile sales salesman, very possible that uh, there's uh, uh, records about early automobile dealerships in uh, the state of Arizona, for example, or any other state. So these are the kinds of things that you can uh, begin to, to use uh, to jump off of these uh, census records and uh, use the information to, uh, to do what you need to do. And by the way, the, the occupations are uh, fall into categories, but they are uh, available from 1850 to 1940. So the 1850 census, when they began keeping track of all of the members of the family becomes the pivotal uh, turning point in, um, in finding information and having a useful, a useful information from the census. Uh, Civil War veterans. Um, whether or not they're a Civil War veteran. That was in uh, 1910 census. Uh, of course, they had to, um, they were taking the count of the Civil War veterans who were still alive. And uh, in 1910, they would probably be in their 80s or 90s uh, or even higher if there were a few in their hundreds, but uh, not very many of the young men of uh, 
it would not have been possible for them to be a Civil War veteran too much longer than, than uh, and still be alive after 1910. Important always to look for family groups and look at every sheet of the area around the, your family. When you find a family in the census, go back and forth. If it's a small town, start at the beginning, read every single page, every schedule of the census, and look for, for names that may be on your, uh, par as part of your family. Uh, in here, for example, uh, there are uh, two individuals who are J.W. Brown, who is uh, 41 years old, living to, next to John Brown, who is also um, 41 years old. Um, and the question is, who, who are these people? Are they related? The answer is probably they're twins. And these are the twins living next to each other in their family. Maybe not. Maybe this one is only is uh, just a cousin that they're maybe they're cousins with the same exact age. Um, and you look back up here and they're both born in November of 1958 and November of 1958. Ah, it gives you a pretty good guess that these two, two men are, are not only brothers, but they're twins. And uh, the interesting thing is that they were born in Utah and Scotland and Ohio, Utah, Scotland, Ohio. Okay, so once you start to look at the totality of this, it will give you uh, an, a good idea about a little bit more insight into, uh, into who these people were and what their families were like. And as I mentioned previously, beware of the birth birthplaces. Just be careful because they were, they were indistinct. Okay, so here we go. Let's, let's just give a good example here. Maybe there's one on this page um, and maybe not, but it's very often where someone will say they were born in a state and it may be before the state was an actual state. Uh, so for example, here, uh, this person was born in 1889 in 1889, and they said they were born in Utah. Well, Utah was not a state. Uh, and so if we just blindly think uh, of Utah, we need to go back also and look at the time frame of where this country, what, what the country actually, or state or province or whatever, was at the time, and understand that, that more information so we can begin to understand how um, these how all of this fits together. Um, in the chat, someone mentioned there are uh, other uh, specialty censuses. Um, they were, uh, one of those is the agricultural census records, but we have a whole set of different kinds of, of special census records. And uh, a good idea to go to the familysearch.org research wiki and start looking at the, the contents of the federal census and the list and the listings of all of the uh, non-population called non-population federal sketches. Here at the here on the right hand side of this little column uh, for the Family Search uh, Research Wiki, you'll see a list of the agricultural, defective, Indian, institutional, manufacturing, merchants all of these different slave schedules, social statistics schedules, veteran schedules, all of these have value and they're all important to look at. They're all available. They're all digitized. Uh, and as the, uh, one of the commentators on the chat or Q and A or chat mentioned that uh, they are um, available um, at archive.org and uh, other places and on family search and on ancestry. So here are the mortality schedules. And uh, during uh, certain periods of time, um, it would list this information. It lists the dead person's name, the age, sex, color, married or widowed, birthplace, month, all of this information. And they were separate from the population schedules. What they were actually doing during the times that they were taken was to um, 
to find out how many people had died in the interim. So they were taken along with the population schedules in 1850, 1860, 70, and 80, and, what, and in six states in 1885. What they did was they found uh, out that these, uh, that the, the number of people that were undercounted in a sense because they died between the two censuses. And so this was an ex uh, just another way of getting additional information. It, it helped some in projecting how many people would be would die in the next between the next two censuses. So these were all the information that they were looking for. They're helpful, of course, to genealogists because they list, list people who may not have shown up in the in the uh, nineteen uh, in the in the eighteen eighty census who um, who died between the eighteen. 60 and 78 between the 1860 census and the 1670 census and the 1880 census. Agricultural schedules, since most of the United States was uh, were farmers, uh, this is a great place to go for information uh, for 1850, 60, and 70. And they listed all of this kinds of information, the owners, the improved acres, the livestock, the agricultural goods. Now you can take this at face value and just say, okay, we've got these numbers, big deal, who cares? The answer is it will give you a relative of economic status of your ancestor on the agricultural file, but it'll also give you insight into a whole bunch of different records that might be available for uh, the farming if they were a farmer and they owned the farm, then there's land ownership records. There's probably uh, agricultural organizational records that could be that will be have this person. The list of records that you could derive from uh, from finding an individual like this in the census is is literally endless. There's just an amazing amount of information out there. Manufacturing schedules do exactly the same thing. However, they do for the people who were the um, uh, manufacturers. And it may be helpful uh, to understand the, the, it, the industries. And if your, your person was living in that area, there's a very good chance that they were working or may have worked or someone in their family may have worked for one of these uh, organizations. Now, this is, these are the people who are lost from usual counting and from um, that it may, being available to um, the researchers. These are people who disappear, and these are people who never appear, and uh, people who are very difficult to, um, to find. And you will just be. Uh, uh, over at, at some point in time, I think all of us, when they get into this and realize the scope of how many people were marginalized and who lived in these institutions and died in these institutions is just overwhelming. I, there's a, a whole part of the uh, Provo City Cemetery here in Provo, Utah that uh, is dedicated to people who died while they were uh, uh, interred um, as inmates at, at uh, the a, uh, an asylum for these for these people, sort of for all these different kinds of people, regardless of they were put together with uh, whether you were insane or not. Sometimes you were in with insane people. We have sort of a uh, general genealogical thing about uh, minorities in the United States that somehow they're different or somehow they were treated differently and they were and sometimes they and very very much there's many problems with uh, with the prejudice the racial prejudice and all of the other things that show up as you do genealogical research but uh, uh, to tell people that are uh, American that, that come from American Indians is that they have no, uh, or Native Americans, if you want to use that term. By the way, the Indians use the term Indian. Um, census rolls also from 1885 through 1940 uh, show and enumerate the American Indians who lived here. 
And uh, there are also roles going back to our earlier days when you get into certain parts of the United States. So the census records is always a good place to start. And it's also a good place to start with the descendants of the, of the enslaved people who were in the United States. Um, the slave schedules can give you a lot of insight and it's uh, probably for some now very disturbing to find out that their ancestors were slaveholders. But uh, that's part of having history. Um, my grandmother used to say, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your relatives. Mm, some of us try hard, but uh, that's probably true. Too bad there are no names of the enslaved people on the slave schedules. The best records for enslaved people would be probate records during that probate time, all of that time. And the obvious reason was that because they were considered to be personal property. So despite the apparent ease of using the US census records, like look, oh, look, here it is. We've got a census record. Oh, there's your family in the census. The reality is very different. Not only is there a lot of, of, of there's a lot of other records that are um, immediately uh, suggested by the census by finding a, a family or person in the census records, but it takes a lot of, of you need to know a considerable amount about the census in order to accurately use and interpret the information. I have cannot tell you how many people have come into the library over the, the last many, many years and, and basically said, I need to, I'm looking, need help finding my ancestors in Germany. And so we say, well, where do they come from in Germany? Well, Germany. Well, how do we, where are we going to start looking? Anyway, that dialogue usually comes about because they find a US census record that said that they came from Germany. And that is just not even enough to begin the story. So we need to, uh, that just leads to a lot of other research that's absolutely necessary. Kind of just a few admonitions here at the, uh, at the end of this. Don't trust the indexes, read the sheets, look at everything on the sheet, go past back in area, the populated area or county, go look at all these records because you people live near their relatives and you may find the rest of the family listed in, this, in these records, at least a suggestion of people you ought to look at. So it's just very important to do that. And if you think you've looked up the name in, in one of the websites, if you've looked it up in Ancestry or you've looked up the name and you said, oh, I never found them. They're not in the census. I can't find them. It means nothing. All that means is that someone didn't index it properly or they skipped it or they uh, wrote it down so different that you can't even begin to recognize that that's the way your family was, was named. Um, I learned that the hard way because Tanner, which you think a very simple name, is not. And uh, it was misspelled in many of the census records. In fact, it, it does come up as Turner quite frequently. And looking into the future, next year <clears throat> in 2022, the 1950 census will be released. And there will be a flurry, there'll be a flurry of activity and probably a lot of opportunity to help to index and uh, look at the new at the census re re records. As time goes on, uh, I think the census returns are going to be of less and less value, uh, particularly with the amount of information that has been collected and is available on the internet. Okay, well, thanks for watching. I appreciate uh, all of you who. Um, uh, were able to uh, come today and uh, those who persevered and listened to the whole class.